In the second part of this chapter, we are going to start talking about motor neurons. So we reviewed muscle function a little bit, talked about muscle tone, um, what happens to a muscle if it's immobilized in a shortened position or a lengthened position. Um, in this um, section, we're going to start really talking about um, not the muscles, but the motor neurons that connect with the muscles. So um, a denervated muscle doesn't do us any good because we don't have a way to contract it except externally. Um, so we need that muscle, that motor nerve to um, get it done. So the learning objectives for this section is I want you to be able to describe reciprocal inhibition um, on a neural level. I want you to be able to describe the difference between slow twitch and fast twitch muscle fibers and give an example of each in the body. Um, you guys are probably like right on that, like, hey, I know that one already. So let's talk about it. So motor neurons are commonly referred to as either motor neurons or lower motor neurons. Lower motor neurons meaning that they originate at the, um, the ventral spinal nerve root. Um, and they go out to the muscles versus the upper motor neurons or motor tracts, which originate in the cerebral cortex and come down to the spine. Motor neurons or lower motor neurons are the only neurons that convey signals to extrafusal and interfusal skeletal muscle fibers. So the upper motor neurons or motor tracts do not connect to the muscles. They connect to interneurons in the spine which then connect to the lower motor neurons. So there are two different types, alpha and gamma. Um, both alpha and gamma have cell bodies in the ventral horn of the spinal cord. So the motor tract um, neurons or upper motor neurons, their cell bodies are in the cerebral cortex. The alpha and gamma lower motor neurons have cell bodies in the ventral horn of the spinal cord. So um, Within the spinal cord, there are cell body pools. So the cell bodies of these um, motor neurons, um, the cell bodies whose actions project to a single muscle are clustered in motor pools. Um, so the motor pools are groups of muscles that work together. The anterior lo in anteriorly located pools innervate extensors and posterior pools innervate flexors. So flexors and extensors clump together, uh, flexor and, and extensor neurons clump together in the spinal cord. Um, a myotome is a group of muscles that's innervated by a single spinal nerve. So we've talked about dermatomes, it's the um, skin area that's innervated by a single spinal nerve. Myotomes are groups of muscles that are innervated by a single spinal nerve. So alpha motor neurons, again, they live in the ventral horn of the spinal cord, their cell bodies, they have large cell bodies and large myelinated axons. Um, axons of alpha motor neurons project to extrafusal skeletal muscle, branching into numerous terminals as they approach the muscle. So as you can see here, it has a simplified um, diagram, of course. There are two different alpha motor neurons and they're going out and then they branch into several different branches with which they innervate those individual muscle fibers. Normally an alpha motor neuron releases enough acetylcholine to contract all of the muscle fibers it innervates at once. So remember I said um, a few chapters back that um, at the uh, neuromuscular junction it's always an excitatory um, postsynaptic potential. So when um, the message is coming down an alpha motor neuron, it's releasing enough acetylcholine to contract all those muscle fibers, okay? So the extrafusal fibers are the fibers that are on the outside of that muscle belly. On the inside of the muscle belly, we have the, the um, fibers that are um, innervated by gamma motor neurons. Gamma motor neurons are medium-sized myelinated axons and the axons of gamma motor neurons project to intrafusal or the interior fibers in the muscle spindle. So alpha and gamma have to work together to monitor the length of the muscle. During most movements the alpha and gamma motor neurons 
function simultaneously. And the purpose of that is to maintain the stretch sensitivity of the muscle spindle when the extrafusal muscles are contracted. So the alpha motor neuron contracts the extrafusal muscle fibers, and we want the gamma motor neurons to contract at the same time to maintain the stretch sensitivity of the muscle. So the alpha gamma coactivation occurs because more sources of input to alpha motor neurons have collaterals that project to gamma motor neurons. So you get that coactivation because the alpha motor neurons can actually um, have an excitatory effect on the gamma motor neurons. So you want the whole muscle to contract simultaneously and maintain the stretch sensitivity of the muscle. So a motor unit is the alpha motor neuron and the muscle fibers it innervates. Okay, slow twitch fibers constitute most of the muscle fibers in the postural and slowly contracting muscles. And we knew that, right? Um, Henneman's size principle is the order of recruitment of muscles from smaller to larger alpha motor neurons. So smaller, the um, nervous system will contract the smaller um, muscle motor units first and then go into the larger ones. Um, there is some variation in the number of muscle fibers innervated by a single neuron. Um, whenever an alpha motor neuron is activated, the neurotransmitter acetylcholine is released at all of its neuromuscular junctions and all the muscle fibers innervated by that neuron contract. So remember a couple slides back, those alpha motor neurons branched off um, and contacted a bunch of neuromuscular junctions. Well, when that um, neuron fires, all of the neuromuscular junctions at once that it's attached to fire with it. So you get that, um, you get enough acetylcholine to contract the entire motor unit. So the um, fast twitch muscle fibers um, are, of course, in the, the larger, more powerful muscles, and the slow twitch muscle fibers are in the postural and slowly contracting muscles. So the spinal cord has to coordinate all this stuff. Neural communication within the spinal cord contributes to coordination of movement. We have several spinal cord mechanisms that organize and synchronize muscle contractions. Um, one of them is reciprocal inhibition. And we also have muscle synergies where the muscles work together to perform certain motions. Um, proprioceptive input, so the, the spinal cord processes proprioceptive input from the somatosensory system and uses it to control and synchronize muscle contractions. Um, in the muscular system. And then we have some spinal cord um, interneurons that are called stepping pattern generators, and they actually help us do our normal walking pattern. So those are developing when we're babies, and when we get to the point where we can walk, um, they've developed. So that's, that's one of the neural mechanisms that develops as we're um, growing. So reciprocal inhibition is the inhibition of antagonist muscles during agonist contraction. So we're gonna use, um, for an example, our favorite muscle, the biceps brachii. And so when we pick something up using our biceps brachii, um, we actually get inhibition of the triceps to allow our elbow to bend. Um, it's achieved by interneurons in the spinal cord that link motor neurons into functional groups. Remember how I said there were motor pools where um, extensors were pooled together and flexors were pooled together? So when the flexors are contracting, um, muscle spindles within that muscle sends a signal to the spinal cord that activates interneurons to inhibit the motor neurons of the extensors of the antagonist group. Um, and this also prevents activation of antagonist muscles when an agonist um, when an agonist is reflexively activated. So if you have a reflex um, action going on from the spinal cord, um, it keeps you from co-contracting the muscles. It um, actually inhibits the um, antagonist. 
So um, we can use this to our advantage sometimes in um, when we're uh, trying to strengthen or stretch a certain muscle group in the clinic, um, the, we can use the reciprocal inhibition to um, relax the antagonist muscle group. So muscle synergies, normal muscle synergies, coordinate muscular action. The nervous system uses muscle synergies constantly. So we're never doing, you know, in kinesiology, we talk about each muscle action as though it's unique and distinct, and it's not. It's actually working in concert with other actions. Um, interneurons are excited by type 2 afferents that project to motor neurons of muscles acting at other joints. So a lot of muscles are acting together. Um, motor control researchers typically use the term uh, muscle synergy for the activity of muscles that are activated together in a normal nervous system. However, in the clinic, we're often talking about muscle synergies in terms of pathological synergies, like when someone has a stroke and they have flexor synergy. So when they try to do a distinct motion, all of the flexors in their arm contract together. So there's a difference between normal muscle synergies and pathologic synergies. There's a picture in the book of a woman post stroke raising her arms and you can see the flexor synergy in her uh, more affected arm. So even though um, motor control researchers talk about um, muscle synergies as the activity of muscles that are activated together in the clinic, we're often talking about pathologic synergies. So just kind of know that in your, um, in the back, put that on the back burner. And then in um, neuro rehab, when you're talking about um, stroke rehab, um, it'll be there waiting for you on the back burner. So Golgi tendon organs play a role in movement. They contribute to proprioception by registering tendon tension. The role of Golgi tendon organs in movements is to adjust muscle contraction. So it's not a big, powerful effect. It's not enough to inhibit voluntary muscle contraction, but it, um, it's doing little adjustments. So a lot of our proprioceptive input is doing tiny adjustments to fine tune movements. So the example is stimulation of uh, Golgi tendon organs in extensor muscles during weight bearing elicits autogenic excitation of the muscles of origin. So um, it's, it's, stimulating the muscles that you're using. Um, so it's sort of reinforcing the movement pattern, which is good. So you can sort of think of the Golgi tendon organs as um, adjusting and reporting to the cerebellum to adjust and making those, smoothing out our movements and eliminating unwanted movements. So stepping pattern generators, it's really our, the spinal control of our walking. Um, uh, SPGs are adaptable networks of spinal interneurons that um, activate motor neurons to elicit alternating flexion and extension of the hips and the knees. So when that goes wrong, people have trouble with that reciprocal motion. Um, each lower limb has a dedicated stepping pattern generator. So if one's working and one's not, you'll have a, a, an unequal, unsymmetrical gait pattern. Um, the afferent input from the somatosensory system adjusts the timing and facil uh, facilitates transition from stance to swing phase of gait and reinforces muscle activation. So you guys are going to be, um, you, you might even now in your um, 113 class be talking about um, gait and know that the um, spinal cord interneurons are really um, adjusting and adapting that gait to give you that normal reciprocal gait motion. Kind of cool. When it doesn't work and then it's decidedly not cool and that's when they have to come to PT to have neuromuscular re-education. So um, with spinal reflexes, most movement is automatic or voluntary or anticipatory. So um, when you uh, examine someone's reflexes in the clinic, that gives us information about the peripheral and the central nervous system. Spinal reflexes can operate without brain input. 
So they use the interneurons in the spine to um, do their thing. So a lot of times when someone's had a neurological injury, one of the ways that they can tell um, that things are improving is they have improved reflexes. So um, I was working with a guy um, just this week in the clinic with, um, a, with sh a shoulder injury, and he had diminished um, biceps tendon reflexes um, at the start. Um, and now that he's getting better, he has improved um, biceps tendon reflexes. So um, one of the, um, that's one of the reasons why we examine reflex in the clinic, because it tells us what's going on in the peripheral nervous system and sometimes in the central nervous system. With him, it's peripheral, the guy I was talking about. So muscles contract in response to quick stretch, and that's called the phasic stretch reflex, and it's the muscle spindle. So the muscle spindle, remember, is, um, is a sensory neuron that um, responds to the velocity of stretch of the muscles. So a quick muscle stretch activates signals from muscle spindles to the alpha motor neurons of the same muscle and causes the muscles to contract. So you get a quick muscle contraction in response to a quick stretch. That is a phasic stretch reflex. So a lot of times we can use that to our advantage to elicit a good muscle contraction. Do a quick stretch and you get a muscle contraction. 